Good evening, church family. It's great to be here, and as always, it's so great to, to see everyone out. So very thankful for the presence of all who are here on this, this Wednesday night. Uh, opportunity for us to gather together as God's people and open up the Word of God and read and study from it and just to kind of give us a boost to get us on through the rest of the week. We're going to have a word of prayer before we get into our Bible class. I'm going to ask Brother Jesse, if he would, to come and lead us in that prayer, and then we'll go ahead and get started. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we come before you so thankful today for everything that you blessed us with. We're so thankful, Father, that you you so show us the changing of the seasons with the with the rain and the, the blooming flowers and trees and grass. We know that that uh, planting time is coming and that you will bless us with a with a harvest. Father, we pray that you will also bless us with a harvest of souls. We pray that you will bless our efforts as we Try to reach out to others here and that you will be with uh, this congregation that will remain strong. Help our elders to always lead us in the in the right way, in the way that will be best for us. Give them wisdom and, and diligence in their studies. Father, we pray that you'll be with us tonight as we as we study again in your Bible. Help us, Father, to, to glean the right message from it, to be active listeners and to participate and to always... Uh, Seek the best, Father, because we know that, that your word contains the best for us. Again, Father, we ask that you will strengthen us, that you'll help us to always put you first in our lives, to to walk in the light, and to, to have the strength to to forgive others, Father, when they sin against us. We ask this prayer in the precious name of your Son, Jesus. Amen. Yeah. Psalm 127, the Bible teaches us that children are an heritage from the Lord. And so I think about all children and what a blessing they are because the word heritage just literally means blessing. And for those of you who are not able to be here and to be a part of the, the service and to be a part of the fellowship, you, you miss Kira hollering out amen at the end of every prayer. <laughs> and uh, I, I love to hear her say that. Yeah. But anyway, uh, she's a it's very sweet, uh, very special baby. Uh, has a very special place in my heart because she knows my name, first of all. And so sometimes she will say David. And so I know she's talking about me. Of course, it could be some other David, but uh, she is a sweet baby. Open your Bibles, if you would, to Second Chronicles chapter 20. Second Chronicles chapter 20. In 2 Chronicles chapter 20, uh, beginning in verse 6, the Bible teaches us, or of course in this particular passage of Scripture, uh, there is a king by the name of Jehoshaphat, and he is exclaiming or he is professing the greatness, the tremendous power of the Lord. And in verse 6, the Bible says, or he says, O Lord God of our fathers, are you not God in heaven? And do you not rule over all the kingdoms of the nations? And in your hand is there not power and might, so that no one is able to withstand you? Are you not our God, who drove out the inhabitants of this land before your people Israel, and gave it to the descendants of Abraham, your friend forever? When you look at this passage of Scripture, if there is one thing that we can see, that Jehoshaphat is trying to get the people to see as he prays this prayer is the very fact that regardless of what happens in life, who is in charge, who is in control, who is ruling, God is. And I think about Israel at this time, they're completely surrounded by their enemies. And what does Jehoshaphat do? He appeals to the great power of God. Take that verse and go with me to the book of Psalm chapter 121. Go with me to Psalm chapter 121. And I want you to note what David says here in this particular passage of Scripture. Psalm 121 beginning in verse 1. And he says, I will lift up my eyes to the hills. 
from whence comes my help? My help comes from where? It was from the Lord who made heaven and earth. The very fact that David goes on to say that God is the one who made heaven and earth. If he is the one who could make this world in which we live. And as you and I go out and we look up and we look at the beautiful creation and we look up at the stars in the heaven and we recognize that God made that. If he could make that, then can't he help us? There's nothing that he cannot do for us. He will not allow your foot to be moved. Look at what he says in verse 3. He keeps you and he will not slumber. Behold, he keeps Israel, shall neither slumber nor sleep. Not only is he a keeper, he says it again in verse 5, but you drop down to verse 7 and he says, the Lord shall preserve you from all evil. He shall preserve your soul. The Lord shall preserve you from going out, from your coming in, from this time forth, even forevermore. Note the message of the psalmist. Not only does God keep us, but he preserves us. How long is he going to do it? forevermore. Why? Because he is the one who is king, he is the ruler, and he is reigning. Now, the people under Jehoshaphat, they needed that message when they were surrounded by God's people. And the people, whoever are reading this psalm, needed this message right now. And I want to submit and tell you that when you and I look at Revelation chapter 15, if there is a message that these people needed, it was the very fact that God is in control, that He is ruling, that He is going to keep them, and that He is going to preserve them. In chapter 13, we saw wherein the Bible taught us or the Bible portrayed unto us the very fact that there was going to be a king, there would be a ruler. Not only would he persecute the people, not only would he pour wrath upon the people, but many of them would even be put to death. Why? Not because they were wicked, not because they were evil, but because the very fact that they professed Christianity in the life that they lived. And they needed a message of hope. The empire of Rome wanted them to think that they were rulers, that they were the great power. But John opens up chapter 15 by letting them know that that's what Rome thinks, but it ain't true. Because who is the great power? It's God. And that God has the power. He has the ability to keep you, and He has the ability to preserve you. And I think that's what you have in, in the book of Revelation chapter 15. Chapter 15 and 16 are the, uh, are in those two chapters, we're going to see God wherein he is going to pour out seven bowls of wrath upon the Roman Empire. And you remember, we so far what we have seen is we've seen seven seals, we've seen seven trumpets, and now we're about to see seven bowls of wrath. Remember the seals is a revelation. Here's what God is going to do. And the trumpets are a warning. Look, you've got to make a change in your life because this is what's going to happen. The pouring out of the bowls of wrath is a representation of God's judgment in the very fact that it's too late, that they can't change. They've reached a point to where the very fact that God's judgment is set and they are going to reap the consequences. It's much like in the days of Noah. Noah, the Bible teaches us in the book of 2 Peter chapter 2, was a preacher of righteousness. And every day as he was building on that ark, he preached the message of God to those people. And those people had an opportunity to get on board that ark just like he and his family did. But when the door was shut, an opportunity was over. The judgment had come. And folks, chapter 15 is about God shutting the door. And judgment is about to come. Now, you and I are going to read about the wrath of God. Right? But remember, the wrath of God is not for those who are in Christ Jesus. I want you to see this before we continue on because I don't want you to think that as children of God, then God's wrath is for us. I want you to go back to the book of Romans chapter 5. Go to Romans chapter 5 and I want you to look at verse 9. In Romans chapter 5 and verse 9, 
the Bible says, much more than having now been justified by His blood. Because you and I are in Christ Jesus, we have been justified by the blood of Jesus Christ. In other words, we have been declared righteous by God. Okay? Now look at the remainder of this passage. We shall be saved from wrath through Him. Because you and I are justified, because we are covered in the blood, and as long as we walk in the light as He is in the light, and that blood continually cleanses us, look, nothing is going to stop God's wrath from coming. It came upon the Roman Empire. Brothers and sisters, I, I encourage you to recognize that God's wrath is coming again. There's going to come a time when He's going to say, enough. There's going to come a time when His judgment is complete and He's going to send forth His angels and His Son and this world upon which we live today is going to be completely and utterly destroyed. Now when that time comes, just as in what we are reading about in Revelation chapter 15 and 16, for you and I as God's people, we do not have to fear the wrath of God. Why? Because we have been justified by the blood. We are in a saved condition. And you and I can have confidence in our salvation. And we can have confidence in the victory that God is going to give to you and me. That's the message that John wanted these people to know. And brothers and sisters, that's the message that you and I need to know today. Now, chapter 16 in and of itself is the chapter where you're going to see these seven bowls of wrath being poured out. And so what is chapter 15? Chapter 15 is what I like to refer to as an introduction to these seven bowls of wrath being poured out. And there are several things that are going on in this chapter. And what I want us to do is I want us to take the time to look at each one of them. This, this is the shortest chapter in the entire book, just eight verses. But let's begin, first of all, by looking at this great and this marvelous sign that John describes in verse one. Note, if you will, in verse one, the Bible says, then I saw, John says, then I saw another sign in heaven Great and marvelous, seven angels having the seven last plagues, for in, in them the wrath of God is complete. Now note if you will that John begins by saying, then I saw another sign. That indicates to us that he has already seen a sign before this particular revealing here in chapter 16. And, and he had. In fact, this is the third sign that John will reveal to the people, likewise to us. And not only that, but it is the final sign that he will reveal in this book. Now, let's go back and look at the very first sign. And when you go back to the very first sign, you're going to go back to chapter 12 and verse 1. All right? Let's look at each one of these signs up to the third one. The first sign is found in chapter 12 and verse 1. Now a great sign appeared in the heavens, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a garland of 12 stars. Now if you remember, we talked about this sign as a sign that represented greatness, a sign that represented majesty, a sign that represented the divine righteousness of God, because of the very fact that his people had persevered. Note, if you will, how he portrays them. He portrays them as being clothed with the sun, as the moon under their feet. That means that they are standing victorious upon every obstacle that has come between them and God. And a, a, a head, on her head was a garland of 12 stars, a victory crown. And so you've got this divine revealing here in this particular sign. But if you'll note, the second sign is in verse 3. And it says, And another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great fiery dragon having seven heads and ten horns and seven diadems on his heads. Now, here is another sign. What did it represent? It represented the satanic uh, opposition that came against this divine revelation of God's people being, being victorious. Even though Satan knew that God's people were going to win, 
He's still going to come at them. Just like today, even though He knows that the victory is ours, you know what He's going to do every day of our lives. He is going to keep coming at us. But you and I don't have to fear. Why? Because we have the victory because we're in Christ Jesus. So you've got this first sign, which is a representation of the divine righteousness of God's people. You've got this second sign, which is a satanic opposition. And then you've got this third sign. And this third sign, brothers and sisters, is a manifestation of tragedy. It's a manifestation of the judgment that God is about to bring upon His people. This is not a good sign, is it? It's not. Because it's toward those who are disobedient. Alright, now, so John says, I saw another sign in heaven. And he says, it's great. And he said, it was marvelous. And then he goes on to say, seven angels having the seven last plagues for in them, the wrath of God is complete. What is it that is making this sign so terrible? Or what is it that is making this sign so great of such magnitude? Note, if you will, the word seven. Do you see it? It appeals right here in this passage of Scripture. You've got seven angels, and what do they have? They have seven plagues. Now, when you see the word plague, don't let that throw you off. Because John is going to use the word plague and the word wrath, and he's going to use them interchangeably. When he's talking about the plagues, he's talking about the wrath. In fact, he'll use the word plague right here in verse 1. He'll use the word plague in verse uh, verse 6. He'll use it again in verse 8. He will use it again in verse 9. And then he will use it in verse 21 of chapter 16. And so when he's talking about these bowls of, of wrath, he is using the idea of a plague to get the attention of the people. Now, when you think of a plague, what comes to your mind? I begin to think back into the Old Testament. You remember there was a chapter in the Bible that spoke of plagues that were brought upon people who were, in essence, persecuting God's people. You remember? It was the land of Egypt. And because of their wickedness and because of the way that they treated God's people, do you remember what God did to them? He brought ten different plagues upon them. And the word plague here in this particular passage of Scripture literally is defined as a stripe or a wound. Metaphorically, what it's doing is it's representing the tremendous heavy burden that is about to be brought upon these people. And you can go back under the Old Testament and you can look under the land of Egypt. If you remember, that's exactly what happened to them. All of those plagues were a very fact of God's punishment because of the way that they were treating God's people. And likewise, when you look right here, Rome is about to experience punishment for the way that they have treated God's people. And the intensity of that punishment is consumed in the idea number one of seven. In other words, the punishment that God is going to bring upon them is going to be a complete punishment. And you can see that also in the word complete right here in verse one. Look at what he says. For in them, the wrath of God is what? It is complete. All right. What does that word complete mean? Well, we would say based upon the word seven that it refers to fullness. But let's look at a verse in the Bible where we can see that word and perhaps give us a different definition to this word complete. I want you to go with me to the book of John chapter 19. Let's go to the gospel account of John in chapter 19. And there I want you to note... Uh, if you will, begin in verse 28. Let's begin in verse 28. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, he said, I thirst. Now a vessel full of sour wine was sitting there, and they filled a sponge with sour wine, put it on hyssop, and put it to his mouth. So when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And bowing his head, he gave up the spirit. I want you to look at the phrase, it 
is finished. You see the word finished? That's the same identical word that is used back here in, Rome, in Revelation chapter 15 in verse 1. Complete. What did Jesus mean when he said, it is finished? Everything that he had come to do had been accomplished. In fact, you can see that in verse 28. All things were now what? They were accomplished. And after everything was accomplished, what did He do? He died. And so take that thought and go back to Revelation chapter 15 and verse 1 where it says that the wrath of God is complete. Not complete in the sense that it's already done, but complete in the sense that it is about to be enacted. Everything that God has done, just like with Jesus Christ, He sent His Son, and Jesus pleaded with the people, and they rejected Him, and they put Him to death on the cross. In the same sense, God had pleaded with Rome. He had pleaded with them and begged them through the opening of the seals, through the sounding of the trumpets, to turn back to God, but they refused. So what do we see? We see the judgment of God, and it has come, and it is time. In other words, God says, I've had enough. You know, when I think about this, and, and especially when you go back and you look at history, and you recognize that Rome was destroyed, never again would they be recognized as a great empire. So that lets us know that, that the prophecy of God's word is true. We can take it to the bank. The Bible also teaches us that God's wrath is building up right now toward mankind. And there's going to come a day Believe it or not, when it's going to be revealed. Many people don't believe it. Oh, God is good and He is kind and He is loving. And oh, oh, He is. But I'm reminded of what the Apostle Paul said in Romans chapter 2. Behold the goodness of God. Yeah, God is good. But what else does Paul remind us of? The severity of God. God is good every day. Has He been good to you? Yes, He has. And not only is He good to you and me, He's good to everyone. He causes His Son and His reign to fall upon the just and the unjust. But there's going to come a time when His wrath is going to be poured out upon this world in which we live. And you can see that in so many different places in the Bible. And go with me, if you will, to the book of 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. Go to 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 and note what the writer says there in that passage of Scripture. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, beginning in verse 6, seeing it is a righteous thing with God to repay with tribulation those who trouble you and to give you who are troubled rest with us when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with His mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who do not know God and those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, these shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His power. And when He comes in that day to be glorified in His saints, to be admired among all those who believe because our testimony among you was believed. There is coming a day of God's wrath. Now, for you and I, we can say, come Lord Jesus. But for those who are not ready, those who are not prepared, the wrath of God is not going to be a good thing. We need to be ready. We need to live every day prepared. Now, note if you will, beginning in verse 2, and going through verse 4, you have a song of what I like to refer to as victory. And the reason I say that is because you've got the word victory right there in verse 2. In verse 2, John says, And I saw something like a sea of glass mingled with fire. Now this is not our first time to read about the sea of glass. If we were to take the time, and we can go back to chapter 4, and you'll look at verse 6, and there in the throne room, the Bible says before the throne, there was a sea of glass like crystal. 
And in the midst of the throne and around the throne were four living creatures full of eyes in front and back. And if we were to back up into verse 4, you'll note that there were 24 thrones around that throne that was represented of all the redeemed. You can read about those individuals in chapter 7. And so when you and I are reading about this sea of glass, what are we reading about? John is taking us back to the throne room. And so that lets us know that this vision that John is having is a heavenly vision. It's a vision where God is at that particular moment. Because if you'll note back in verse 1, he says that I saw a sign where it was in heaven. But note if you will, you've got this sea of glass, but there's something different about it here. It's mingled with fire. What in the world does that mean? Now you've got to keep in mind that these people who are here, they are representative of the individuals who are the faithful, the redeemed. All of those who are redeemed, whether it be under the Old Testament or under the New Testament. One of the things that we have to experience as God's people is persecution. Now, the Apostle Paul would say in 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 12, all who live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Look at what Peter would say. Back up into the book of 1 Peter chapter 1. Go to 1 Peter chapter 1. And I want you to look at uh, beginning in verse 6. First Peter chapter 1 and verse 6, Peter would say, In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if indeed you have been grieved by various trials. What are they experiencing, the people that Peter is writing to? They're not only experiencing trials, tribulations, afflictions, but Peter says that they are being grieved in other words, you think of the word grieve, you think of the, the pain and the agony that you feel when you lose something in this life. Maybe a you, loss of a job or, or loss of a relationship or, or loss of a family member or a friend. And, and Peter says that they are experiencing trials, many different trials, various trials, and they are literally grieving them. Now why? that the genuineness of your faith being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by what? Fire. Literal fire? No. But you know as well as I do, there are some burdens and there are some trials and, and bad things in life that we feel and that we experience, and it's as if we have been thrown into a pit of fire. And that's the terminology being used here. In fact, if you go over to chapter 4, go to chapter 4 and look at verses 12 and 13. Beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you. Now, are they experiencing trials by literal fire? Let's read on. As though some strange thing happened to you, but rejoice to the extent that you are partakers of what? Christ's sufferings. Now, how did Christ suffer? How did he suffer? You remember the scourging? You remember the beating? You remember the crucifixion and all of the physical pain that he went through? And when Peter is talking about the fiery trials, he's talking about the persecutions that they are experiencing as a Christian. These people, brothers and sisters, are standing here around the throne because even though they were persecuted, they did not back down. They persevered. They did not allow anything to keep them from doing God's will. They persevered through the trials that they experienced. And I, I thus believe that that's exactly what John is talking about. They are standing there because even though they were put through trials, and you think of some of the trials, if we were to take the time to go back into chapter 13, if you remember, the first beast was going to inflict pain upon them. He was even going to overcome them. He was going to overpower them. And many of them he was going to put to death. And you continue down and you read about the second beast. And if you remember there in the second beast, the Bible taught us that, that they would uh, create a, an image and force the people to bow down and worship it. And they would have a mark or a means of recognition which would keep them from being able to buy in the markets and so forth. You can only imagine how these people were persecuted. But because they pressed on, look at where they are. 
They're in the throne room, brothers and sisters. And what does that tell us today? Regardless of how we are persecuted. And I really don't. You know, we talk about persecution. But none of us have really been persecuted like they were. But folks, we don't understand what persecution is. There could come a time when we would. There could. Don't, don't think because America the free that nothing bad could ever happen to this nation and, and our rights and privileges be taken away. Too often we take them for granted. We could find ourselves in the same position as these people right here. We could find ourselves under a government that is, is, is so communist like the Roman Empire was that we could be persecuted even to the point of death. What are we going to do? I tell you what we've got to do, if we're going to be there in the throne room, we've got to stand victorious. Because look at what he says. that These individuals are, he saw a sea um, mingled with fire. And those, who is it who is there? It's those individuals who have the victory. And the victory over what? They have the victory over the beast. They have the victory over the image. And they have the victory over his mark. And over the number of his name. They have victory over evil. They have victory over this this beast. They have victory. Period. Now what was the key to their victory? Do you remember? Because if you remember. As chapter 13 ended. You've got this religious side. And this, this religious side has formed this image. Or created this image. And it is forcing the people to bow down to it and to recognize Caesar as Lord. What was it that caused them to have the victory? Well, back up into chapter 14 and look at verse 7. Saying with a loud voice, Fear God, give glory to Him, and worship Him. You don't fear the Roman Empire. You don't glorify the Roman Empire. You don't worship the Roman Empire. But who do you fear? You fear God. Who do you glorify? You glorify God. Who is it that you worship? You worship God. That was the key to victory. Likewise, brothers and sisters, that's the key to victory for us today. Have you, have you seen the pattern that we have looked at in the book of Revelation? It seems as if every time God's people are being persecuted, they are going through a very difficult time in life. The way that they received victory was through reverence to God, was through glorifying God, and through worship to God. Is, is there a message for you and me today? Listen, if, if I want victory, if I want true victory, it, it's going to begin with me fearing God, with me having reverence for Him. And that means in every aspect of my life, whether it be in Christian living, whether it be in, in faithfulness, whether it be in worship like what we're doing uh, this afternoon or this evening, what we're going to do Sunday, it's going to be because of my reverence toward Him. And, and, and secondly, if I'm going to be an individual and I'm going to be victorious, I have to glorify God. That's exactly what we talked about Sunday. I have to let people know in the life that I live the greatness of God. I have to let people know about His graciousness. I have to let people know about His gratitude in the life that I live. And you think about that word glorify. I like to think of it as, as magnify. I can, I can see her right now. If she had lived six more months, she would have been 101. We called her Mammy. She was my great grandmother. And I can remember every morning when she, when we would spend, the, when I would spend the night with her and my, my grandmother, my daddy's mother, that, that she would get up in the morning, and I can remember that up until the age of ninety nine, I mean, she had a crisp, clear mind, and she read the Bible every day. I've got her Bible in my library. I do, and, and her eyesight was fading. She not only wore glasses, but in order to read. She had to have a magnifying glass and she would open up that Bible and then she would take that magnifying glass and, and she would pull it away from the text and then she would read it. 
What was that magnifying glass doing? What was it doing? It was making those words big enough to where she could see them. God is everywhere. You, you know that. You don't need me to tell you that. You and I are confident that God is here. He's present. He's everywhere we look. The psalmist would say, oh, taste and see that God is good. Everywhere we look, we can see God. But the people in the world, they can't do that. So how is it that they taste and see that God is good? Through you and me. Through the lives that we live. Through our good works. The good things that we do in life. And when we do that, we glorify God. And folks, if we want victory in this life, we need to not only reverence God, we need to glorify God, but we need to worship Him. You, you go to the Bible and you see how many pastors talk about worship and the importance of worship. David said, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Psalm 122 and verse 1. He would say this this one thing, this one thing I will seek after, Psalm 27 and verse 4. What is it, David, that you're going to seek after? That I can be in the presence of the Lord. That I can be in the house of the Lord. Worship is so very important. And individuals who choose not to worship, folks, they're not going to have the victory. It's not going to be theirs. But victory is dependent upon us as individuals reverencing God. Individuals glorifying God. Individuals who are worshiping God. And when we have that attitude, when we are those kind of people, I want you to look at how these people are positioned. Now, Rome's intent was to kill them. Rome's intent was to stamp out Christianity. But look at what the Bible says about them in the last part of verse 2. The Bible says that these individuals who who had victory over the beast, over his image, over his mark, over the number of his name. What are they doing? Oh, underline it, highlight it. They are standing. They are standing. And you and I will be in that position too someday. We will be standing with God. We will be standing around the throne. And what are we going to be doing? Note, if you will, the Bible says having hearts of God. We're going to be offering praise to God. Do not think of the word harps here as the uh, teaching, as many religious people will do, is authorization for instrumental music and worship. That, that, folks, if an individual is going to go to this verse and come up with that idea, as some people do, they're completely missing the message of the text. The harps are not literal. No more than the bowls are literal. I mean, when, when you're going to read about seven bowls of wrath, is God's wrath or can God's wrath be literally put in a bowl that you and I can handle? And, and I mean, just, just go beyond that. The, the Bible teaches us that the bowls of wrath are going to be poured out on the earth. It's going to be poured out on the sea, and you drop down to verse 8, it's going to be poured out on the sun. Literally? Is God literally going to pour a bowl of wrath on the earth and, and into the sea and, and on the sun? You see, these things are metaphors. They represent something. And, and the bowl of wrath is just a representation of His judgment that He is going to bring upon this wicked and evil nation. The hearts there in heaven are just a representation that there's going to be praise in heaven as we stand there. Praise like we've never known before. And then if you'll note beginning in, uh, well, I want to back up. You've got a song of victory beginning in verse 3 and going through verse 4. And in verse 3 it says, They sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb. Now some have suggested that these are two different songs, the song of Moses and the song of the Lamb. But I don't think that's what John is trying to get across. Go, at, go back with me, if you will, to the, the 12 tribes of Israel. Do you remember that? As we went back into chapter 7, he talked about the 12 tribes of Israel. What did those 12 tribes represent? They represented all of the redeemed, whether it was those under the Old Testament or 
those under the New Testament. Go back to chapter 4 and you read about the 24 elders. What did that represent? That represented all of the redeemed. All right. Now, we're still in the same place. We're in the throne room. You've got those singing the song of Moses and the song of the Lamb. You've got the Old Testament. You've got the New Testament. And the idea of them all singing it together teaches me, brothers and sisters, on, on that great day, it doesn't matter who we are. It doesn't matter where we're from. It doesn't matter what language we speak. We're all going to be singing this great song. And it's going to be a song like we've never heard before. The song of Moses. The song of the Lamb. It's going to be a song of victory. Now, in this song of victory, I want you to note the main theme of this particular song. If you'll look at verse 4, I think it's all about the reverence that we owe to God. That's what it's all about. Look at verse 4. Who shall not fear you, O Lord, and glorify your name? The word fear there literally means to revere, to, to have awe, to, to have reverence for. And, and so this song is all about the reverence that we are to have toward God. It's all about the reverence that they are to have for, toward God. Why is it that they should have reverence toward God? Number one, because of His works. Look at what He says. Great and marvelous are your works. And isn't that the same true today? When you think about the works of God, they are beyond our imagination. But not only should God be reverenced because of all of His great works, note if you will, God should be reverenced because of His, His, uh, His sovereignty. Note, if you will, that He is described not just as Lord, but look at it. Lord God what? Almighty. I love that word Almighty. It literally, remain, it literally means supreme ruler. That word Almighty is found ten times in the New Testament. Nine of those ten times are found, guess where? Right here in the book of Revelation. What do you think John wants these people to know? That God is sovereign, that He is in charge, that He is ruling. And because of that, He should be reverenced. But number three, note if you will, you've got the ways of God. He is just and He is true. We should reverence God because He is a just God and He is a true God. He is a faithful God. But note, if you will, we should also reverence Him because He is an authoritative God. Look at it. O King of the saints. What does a king represent? It represents an individual who has authority. And because of the authority that he has, which is all of the authority in the world, we should reverence Him. But we should also reverence Him. Look at verse 4. You alone are holy. Now the Bible says that you and I are to be holy. But here it says that God alone is holy. Is that saying that we can't be holy? No. But what John is trying to get these people to see is that God is the holy of holies. And that's why Peter would say, be ye holy. Why? Because God is holy. In all your manner of conversation, you need to be holy. Why? God is holy. And we should reverence Him because He's the most holy being that we know. We should reverence Him because He is worthy of worship. Look at the last part of verse 4. For all nations shall come and worship before you. No one is worthy of worship except for God. But God, He is worthy of every nation, every tongue who has ever existed, to come and bow down before Him. And then finally, why should we reverence God? For your judgments have been manifested. The word judgments there literally means righteousness. And have been manifested, they have been made known. We should reverence God because His righteousness was made known through His Son, Jesus Christ. And because of our obedience to His will, we can have salvation for our soul. What is this song all about? Brothers and sisters, this song is about the great power of God. It is about the very fact that we should have faith in what God has done in the past, what God is doing in the present, and what God is going to do in the future. And because of that, we should reverence Him in the lives that we live. Now, when we reverence Him, it goes right back to what we're going to have in verse 2. What is it? We're going to have victory. We're going to have victory. 
Lord willing, we'll stop. We're going to stop right there, and Lord willing, we'll pick up in verse five next week. And what we will do is we will talk about the opening of the temple in heaven. You've been a great class, as you always are, and I, I truly enjoy teaching the class tonight. It's going to be just a short intermission for those viewing at home, and then following the intermission, we'll have uh, some announcements, and then we will have devotion this evening. Good evening, everyone. It sure is good to see everyone out tonight. It, uh, it is cooler right now than it was first thing this morning. I left the house at 5 o'clock this morning. It was 61 degrees, and it was 50 when I left work. So dropping 10 degrees throughout the day is kind of an interesting thing. It shows the power of God. That's why we're here today. We're here to worship God and be thankful for the power that He has uh, over sin in particular but uh, also the power to give us joy and uh, ability to encourage each other. So we're thankful for you being here to help us with that. I do have some announcements I'd like to share with you. Uh, please uh, keep these folks in your prayers. Larry Jones, Patty Cowan, uh, Lloyd and Joyce Wright, Marcia Jeffers, Jim and Mary Sue Williams, Rachel Reed, Mackenzie Jones, and Jackson Lewis. Please keep all these in your prayers. I'd also like to remind you that we'll have our youth-led worship this Sunday, April 4th, at the 5 p.m. service. Uh, Junior is going to be our speaker there, so we're looking forward to hearing him speak and be here to encourage him and to be encouraged by him. I'm certain it will be a good lesson. I'd also like to remind everyone about our Tuesday morning Bible class. That'll be on the book of Hebrews, right here at the building at 10 o'clock every Tuesday morning. Uh, get a chance to come to that. I'm sure you'll be blessed. Good news. This is the best news I've got to announce in a while. Starting April the 10th, door knocking will resume. Everyone that wants to participate will be here on April the 10th, Saturday at 10 a.m. And that will resume every second Saturday of the month going forward. So we got the opportunity to be that shining light again that we need to be in a more public way. We can't, we can't keep this light hid under a bushel. So if you can help, please be here at 10 o'clock on April the 10th. Also would like to remind you that there is a gospel meeting at the Cardinal Church of Christ. That will be April 11th through the 14th. The theme will be giving defense and Dalton Gilreath will be the speaker. So if you have an opportunity to head over to Cartersville, you will get a blessing from that. Uh, there's some bright orange books out there in the foyer. You can't hardly miss them. They're titled The Spiritual Sword. Got some encouraging words for you, so please be sure and pick up the new copies that we have back there as well. Be sure and check the bulletin boards in the back and the bulletin that uh, we hand out on Sunday morning. A lot of good information there as well. 
At the appropriate time, Brother Randy Overby will lead us in a closing prayer. And before we start our song service, Brother Don has a, a few words for us. Thank you, Brother Jesse. We appreciate it. So good to see everybody out tonight. So good to see you here. And we're glad that you're here and had an opportunity to once again study God's Word. Thank you. The elders had a meeting just the other night, Monday night that is, and the, one of the things we discussed was the health of the church and how things are going. And so we realized uh, that we still are lacking lots of folks here. And so we want to encourage everybody at home who is watching and uh, to consider to seriously consider thinking about coming on back pretty soon. You know about a year ago, the elders made the decision to just close down everything, which we did of necessity. And so we, we went through that to the middle of the summer. Then a little bit later on, we decided to start coming back. And now we're beginning to come back more and more and more. So, you know, it's about time that we ought to really consider everybody who's listening on at home and everybody here listening. And so we can stir everybody up and get ready to start coming back through these doors. There's going to be a time folks have already gotten a lot of the vaccinations. That's a good positive thing. Although I do realize, and everybody's heard about it too, there's you know these other strands and these other things that may be happening. The eldership is going to keep our eyes on the situation. But for now, what we'd like to do is encourage folks, if you possibly will, consider coming back. Consider filling up this building again. You heard David speak just a while ago that for all of us to be able to have that victory in Christ, you know, we need to be united. And this is one good way that we can do that. If you can build up that confidence and come on back. What I'd like to ask is the folks that are listening to come on back. Also, I'd like to ask you who are here tonight, look around and see who's not here. Contact them. Ask them if they would consider coming on back. Is now the time to come back? We, we think it probably is. Like I said, we'll keep our eyes open and we'll be attuned to the situations going on. We're not blind to the fact. If something does come out or something like that, then we'll make further announcements. But at this time, we feel like that we need to expound on coming on back. God bless you all and we encourage you. We love you. Thank you. Three twenty six. Three twenty six. What a fellowship, what a fellowship we find, being on the everlasting arms. What a blessedness, what a peace is mine, being on the everlasting arms. Open your Bibles, if you will, to the book of Psalm chapter 55 and verse 22. Psalm chapter 55, verse 22. As you are going to that passage of Scripture, you may know exactly what it says. You may even be one who you have committed this passage of Scripture to memory, and you could probably just roll it off the tip of your tongue one word at a time. 
I love this verse. It is one of my absolute favorite, and I want us to read it and talk about it tonight. Cast your burden on the Lord, and he shall sustain you. He shall never permit the righteous to be moved. Now, if that verse sounds familiar to you, if you go to the New Testament, 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 7, you're going to see Peter use that very same thought or idea. The reason that I like the psalmist is because the psalmist expands it a little bit more than what Peter does. But I want you to look at what Peter, what the psalmist says right here. Number one, he says, cast your burden on the Lord. I want you to begin with the word burden. What does that word mean? The word burden can refer to anything that weights us down in life. And when you think about a burden or you think about things that weight us down in life, that could be just about anything. It could be some kind of temptation. It could be some kind of thought that you're mulling over in your mind. It could be some kind of trial that you are going through in life. It could be a number of different things that we could refer to. But the most important thing that I need to recognize is not necessarily what the burden is, but the very fact that what the psalmist says is that I need to cast it upon the Lord. And that word cast means exactly what it says. You think about the rear back and throw something. And that's what the psalmist is saying. The psalmist is saying, whatever is burdening you in life, take it and cast it on the Lord. Give it to him. You know, when you go to the New Testament, Jesus told us the same thing, did he not? Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I'll do what? I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart. Jesus bids us to come to him and give us his, uh, give, uh, give him our burdens in life. And when we give God our burdens in life, I want you to look at what God will do for you and me. He's going to sustain us. What does that word sustain mean? The word sustain literally means he is going to fortify you and me. Why do we need fortification? We need fortification so that we can overcome the burdens that you and I experience in life. And where does that fortification come from? It comes from none other than God himself. When I go to him with my burden and I give it to him, he will sustain me. He will give me the ability to stand up and to press on in life. And note what the psalmist says finally, he shall never permit the righteous to be moved. What does he mean by that? Many times burdens in life literally move us. They move us from place to place. But one of the things or one of the areas wherein they move us the most is they move us when it comes to our faith. Many times a burden that we experience in life can cause an individual who at one time was faithful to become unfaithful. But when you and I experience burdens, if we will learn to cast them on the Lord, in other words, go to the Lord with that burden and give that burden to Him, the Bible says that we will never, ever be moved. Why? Because the Lord will not permit it. You may be here tonight and you are bearing a burden that you cannot seem to bear any longer. If you're not a New Testament Christian, I can tell you what that burden is. It's the burden of sin. And you'll never be able to bear that burden on your own. You've got to come to the Lord Jesus tonight. Believe that Jesus is the Son of God. Repent of your sins. Confess your faith in Christ the Son of God. Be baptized for the remission of sins. When you do that, when you take those simple steps, you will be giving the Lord your burden and He will take away every sin that you've ever committed. It will all be washed away. Just like what Paul would, would uh, be told in the book of Acts chapter 22 and verse 16. Arise, be baptized, and wash away your sins. In the waters of baptism, every single burden, every sin that we've ever committed is taken away. But maybe you're here this evening and you're already a child of God. And maybe there's some kind of burden that's weighing you down. Something that's keeping you from being the person that you need to be in life. You know, when we think about burdens, it don't necessarily have to be a sin. It doesn't. We think of the invitation too often as, you know, that's a time when I respond and I go forward because I'm guilty of sin. Look, we are brothers and sisters in Christ. That means we're a family. And if you're having some kind of struggle in your life, where it's keeping you from being the Christian you need to be, and you just need the prayers of the church, that's what we're here for, brothers and sisters. 
And that's what we want to encourage you to do. But if it be a sin in your life that's weighing you down and burdening you, then come and give it to the Lord tonight. Whatever your need may be, won't you come as we stand and as we sing? It has certainly uh, been a great, tremendous pleasure to be here tonight. It's been great to be able to see everyone out, to be able to see your smiling faces, to be able to enjoy the, the great fellowship that uh, we always get to enjoy when we come together. Appreciate you so very much. want to encourage you and, and remind you of our Sunday morning Bible class, uh, 10 a.m. Please come and be a part of that. Uh, Sunday morning worship at 11 a.m. and then our Sunday evening worship. You certainly don't want to miss that. Our young men are going to be leading the services, and they always do a, a fantastic job, and we, we just appreciate them and the work that they do so very much. And so don't forget about those times. Be praying for our first door knocking of the year. I'm so excited about that. Just one week from this coming Saturday, we'll have the opportunity to go out and to be able to share the gospel of Christ with people in our community, to be that light shining in a world of darkness. And so please be praying for that. Nothing else, we're going to be led in our dismissal prayer by Brother Randy. Let's pray. All right, my Father, we're thankful once again for the opportunity to be here during this midweek. And my Father, we're just so thankful for all the many blessings of life that you've given us. We're, we're so thankful for the country that we live in, for the freedom that we have to worship thee. And Heavenly Father, we're just so thankful for Brother David and his ability to preach and teach, and we're just thankful for the message he's brought to us tonight, Heavenly Father. We just are so thankful for him and his family. We just ask you to bless them. And Heavenly Father, we're thankful for our elders as they lead us here. And we know, Heavenly Father, that the decision they've made to try to get everyone to come back, Heavenly Father, we know it's a uh, our decision at this time. And Heavenly Father, we just pray that everyone would think about it and come back. And Heavenly Father, we just know that we have faith in thee that you would keep us safe. And Heavenly Father, we just thank for the church here. We're thankful for all the very uh, all the members that we have, Heavenly Father. And we just ask Heavenly Father that you be with uh, the list that has been read out tonight that those that have been sick and those that are in the hospital, Heavenly Father, that you would be with them and help them and may they get their health back to be out with us once again, Heavenly Father. We ask, Heavenly Father, and as we go on through this week, that you would keep us safe and bring us back to the next point in time, Heavenly Father, and just forgive us of our sins. Just in Christ's name I pray. Amen.